Hear what he has? Yeah, Sally. I have a prayer request. Izzy has pneumonia. Oh, no. And baby is coughing a lot, and the little baby is coughing a lot. Colt and Ivy. So we're going to the doctor tomorrow. We're just keeping him in your prayers. It's been yes. going round and round in that family oh, since yeah. Thanksgiving. One gets it, passes it, and it just keeps going and going and going. So That's all through the school. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Remember them? Okay. I've got an anxiety thing. Joe's having problems with his mom, and I wish that this is settling, just calm down. And he's having, he needs to get a therapist that's going to be about four as you got to talk to a therapist if you don't want to break down and you're not going to be able to see anyone. And I can see it because I try to be calm and it's like, I own this house and I don't understand. Why you react to this way? Well, it's not. You've got to be sensible. Okay. I pray for Joe. Down on me. Pray for me. I don't need more stress than I need. <laughs> okay. Pray for Joe. Pray for you, James. Yeah, Mike. Peter, Jamie, and Jacob. Peter's been facing this. There's an aisle of weight for him to jump onto. Clearly, how to make that jump forward and shut his eye and jump. Let go of what's behind and press forward with what's ahead. And also, a good friend of mine, I've never met him face to face, but we came kind of close together on Facebook. Global Outreach Church, which is a storefront church in DeSoto, Missouri, south of St. Louis, reaching out to drug addicts, people on the street, and everything else like that. It was a small place that was, it could almost fit, the whole church was almost the size of a platform and stuff, but um, the place caught fire, that strip, or that wall, that, it's mm -hmm. like a 1930s strip wall, you might say, storefront situation, we're about six buildings, and uh, it went up in flames two days ago, okay. so we need to pray for that, nobody got hurt, praise God, that, praise but God. the place is pretty much a total loss, except for the sign they just had made on the front of the building, oh, so the, the, the sign was saved. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, fire in the Anyone else tonight? Uh, my friend Carla did ask for prayer tonight. Um, she left to move to North Dakota with her son, and he's graduating this year, and she's facing some decisions whether to stay or whether to go, and um, just asking for direction from the Lord. She was hurt in a car accident last year and has been struggling to find a job since. That job ended and she was at that time. And she just really needs some direction, and um, she needs touch from the Lord. Her name's Carla. Amen. Anyone else? All right, well, let's, oh, yeah. Uh, let's uh, pray for Sarah and Eric. I don't know what the situation was with the band. Uh, pray that they get on their feet and stuff. They just don't want any discouragement coming on them. I don't know if the Lord had something in their life that they didn't show them. They've taken that stuff in faith. And, yeah. I know the enemy's trying to throw a roadblock on their feet, but just pray that they, uh, yeah, they had that meeting with Hy-Vee yesterday, too, yes. so I haven't talked to her, I haven't heard how that went, yeah, so I right, so. um, pray that that's a door that's open, that yeah. the yeah. Lord would make his, <clears throat> give them their favor yeah. to expand and grow their business, yeah. And all the souls gave their heart to Jesus at Winter Game last yeah. Friday night, yeah. pray for them, and also for uh, Hannah and Zeke, I've asked them to come with you, group. to the Lord tonight. Amen. Heavenly Father, we've heard Thank the needs Jesus. tonight. We ask you to go Lord, through Lord, that house in Bondaran. Healing. Healing and deliverance from those diseases and the sickness, Lord. Flow. That your healing Praise flow, God. that not one would get sick, Lord. Symptoms will be gone. Yes, Lord. 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 Yes, Lord.
Yes, Lord. For encouragement, Lord. Strength. Yes, Lord. Strength, Lord. In every one of these situations, Jesus, you know wisdom, exactly what wisdom, we our faith right now wisdom, and, and strength is another, Lord. In each of these lives, Jesus. Pray for Joe tonight, Lord. Pray for James tonight, Lord. Pray for Eric and Sarah tonight, Lord. Pray for the church in Missouri, Lord. All these needs, Lord. For Sarah and Eric, Lord, for their business, Lord. These are opportunities, Lord, for kingdom. For the kingdom to come. For the glory of your kingdom. For the glory of your kingdom, Lord. Pray for Peter and Jamie and Jacob, Lord. Lord, where the disasters are, where the disease is, where the sickness is, where the where the indecision is, where the where the darkness is, Lord, that you are there in the midst, Lord. And you speak in that still small voice. Help those who need to hear you to have ears open to hear. Help them to have eyes open to see, Lord. And let the word be in their heart and on their tongue, Lord. And let the word rise up and be spoken forth and do what it was sent to do. Your word was sent to heal. Your word was sent to deliver. Your word was sent to restore. Your word was sent to reconcile. Your word was sent to bring favor. Your word was sent for the miracles, for the glory of your kingdom. And your word now lives in us. Your word lives in the hearts of your people and the seeds that have been planted. Now is the time for the fruit to be born, for the fruit to come and then for the eat, the fruit of the seed that's been planted. Lord, those who have turned away and have blinded eyes and deaf ears, Lord, let them turn back and see that you're waiting with open arms, just waiting for them to turn and call upon you, Lord, to say your name, and you are right there, welcoming them back, running to meet them. Jesus, let those who are struggling, those who are weak, Lord, find their strength in you. That they mount up on the wings like eagles in the spirit, Lord. That our strength is not of this world. Our strength is from you. From the hope that we have knowing that you are a good, good father. You have left nothing undone. That you have finished the work that we might simply walk in it. And when we have and walk and know that blessed assurance that comes from living our lives in you, Lord. We can do all things when you strengthen us. We can do all things when we'll turn our eyes to you. We can do all things when our words are your words. When our words are spirit and life, they will bear good fruit. So we declare life, not just getting by, but abundant life, a victorious life that comes from knowing you and putting our hope and our trust in you. Letting go of that which weighs us down. Letting go of that which worries us, that which frustrates us. Letting it go and running to you, Lord. In every thought, in every moment, Lord, in every situation. Casting aside the things that weigh us down, Lord. Distractions are all around, Lord. The world shouts and screams, but you speak in a still, small voice. Let us find those moments to hide away and listen. To find those moments of peace that restore us, that restore our vision, that restore our hope, that restore our strength. It is all about you, Lord. But every day we try to make it all about us. Continue to teach us, Lord. Transform our minds. Renew our minds by the word that is planted in our heart. Let us hunger and thirst for the things of your spirit more than the things of the flesh, Lord. And let us just watch and see. Let us just watch and see and rest knowing that you have it all under control. 
that you have made the way that we just simply walk in it. A victorious life when we choose you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Just a reminder, if you brought a cell phone tonight, to silence it to let the end of the service. And we have no announcements. So, Ron, would you please come take an offering tonight? We should have house of prayer in two weeks. And uh, also forgot to lift up Tim and Lee. Uh, as soon as they get back, there's sickness in the family, so we'll just lift them up in prayer also. Father, we just thank you. As your word says, and we truly believe, Yes, you are good, and yes, your mercy yes, does endure forever. Yes, Lord. Father, I thank you that you're opening us up little by little to more revelation of what we are in Jesus Christ. We can grow up to the full stature that you desire your body to step into right now. Yes. Father, I just thank you for all that you're doing in this service. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your word. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for this offering. And thank you for the opportunity to sow into this. Your ministry in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Hallelujah. Thank you that you are a good God. Hallelujah. There's none like you. Father, we just celebrate you and your goodness tonight. All of your good and perfect gifts, Lord, that you have poured out upon us. We thank you, Lord, that it's a never-ending flow of your goodness to us, Lord. As long as we believe, Lord, we continue to receive of your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for what you've already done in this service as we prayed. We know that, Lord, as we pray in agreement with your will, we have our petition. It is finished, Lord. And we celebrate the victory in every one of these situations and every one of these circumstances that you will show yourself mighty as you always do. We just bless you tonight, Lord. And again, we celebrate you and your goodness, Lord. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Suzanne, for opening. Thank you, Mike, Suzanne, and James for leading us in worship tonight. Praise the Lord. And thank all the rest of you, yeah. praise Hallelujah. the Lord, for being here. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen. You know, I insist on uh, <coughs> prefection. Praise God. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Suzanne. Hallelujah for the only one on the same page with me tonight. Praise God. You know, I was thinking about changing the service back to 6.30. We used to have it at 6.30 years ago. Because actually 6.30 is the best time on the clock, hands down. <laughs> I have to keep James up here for just a minute or two after everybody leaves. I need the rim shots. Praise the Lord. Okay, well, enough of all this tomfoolery. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, again, no, I do thank you for being here tonight. God bless all of you. And so we're going to get right into the Word. And again, it's, because it is Wednesday night, we'll try to be brief and get back on the road to your warm, cuddly homes. Praise the Lord. The only place we want to be after tonight, I guess, for the next couple of days anyway. But it is nearly February in Iowa, so the good thing is, Ron and I were talking about this, there's like 40, what did I say, 42 days? 42 days till spring. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So it's right around the corner. Hallelujah. Yes, praise the Lord. March 20th, and so thank the Lord. I'm ready for it right now. Of course, I've been ready for it since about... The 26th of December, praise God. <laughs> All right, praise God. Let's, let's begin. We'll, we'll start it uh, in John chapter 6. And I'm going to read uh, verses 25 through 35. Praise the Lord. John 6, 25 through 35. And this is one of those that just wanders all over the place because that's where my mind has been doing for the last several days. Praise the Lord. But it's okay, it's all, it's all in God. So when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? And Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for, he, for him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. And they said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. 
Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then, they, then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. If you drop down to verse 41, Mike. And the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Verse 43. And Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Shut up. No, he said, Murmur not among yourselves. And now verse 48 through 52. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So, basically what Jesus is saying here is, You're looking for signs and wonders. And I've been happy to give them to you. But you're missing the point. It's not about signs and wonders, but what the signs and wonders are pointing to. Amen? The manna that was given to Israel wasn't about Moses. It wasn't uh, about uh, giving them a, a great story to be able to pass on from generation to generation. But it was about God. It was about pointing them to God. To make them, or to make us in this case, rely on God. To have you connect the provision of life itself to God Himself. Praise the Lord. I... Well, I won't get ahead of myself. He gives us a never-ending meal of bread. Amen. And he does that so we'll remember manna and see Jesus as our manna right now. Praise the Lord. So the concept of being in Christ is the key to Christianity. It's not rules. It's not regulations. It's not religion. It's not the rituals and all the other things that we think about. The key to Christian faith is in Christ, or in Him. Amen? And we've diluted this thing down into practical incoherence, to be quite honest with you. It's just like we talk about it so much it doesn't make any sense anymore. I mean, I, mean, I see the things that people say that are going through struggles, and listen, I, I understand it. We all go through them. We've all had our times of challenges, and, and probably will have in the future. But at some point, we've got to realize that Jesus was, ta was talking about being in us. Yes. But now when he talks about him being in us, that's sustenance, not enhancement. All right? So look at John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. John 15, verses 4 and 5. So abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So here, he's fusing this living in us with our living in him. Amen? But the bottom line is, without him, there isn't any life. Period. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Amen? The only thing... In reality, the only thing outside of Christ is death. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, amen, until we came to Christ, until we were in Christ, until we became a part of that. Now, let's, now I want to just take this in a little bit different di direction, but we're still here, okay? So let's go to Revelation chapter 18, and I want to read verses 4 through 7. Revelation 18, uh, 4 through 7. Now we've, I'm not going to go back through all of this again, but you remember we talked about our soul, our suke, you know, our natural way of thinking, and the feminine and the spirit is the masculine. Amen. So, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her trouble according to her works. And the cup which she hath filled, 
filled, filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. All right. Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Verse, or excuse me, chapter 21 and verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride ordained for her husband. So we've got two women here. One of them is, is confused and a whore or a harlot, and the other is a bride. Babylon is this confused religious system. Amen. But it also has a personal application. Like most scripture, there's what's on the surface, and then there's something spiritual that God's trying to impart. Amen? So it has this personal application, and speaking individually of the confusion in our soul. Now that's what I hear when I hear people say, this doesn't work. Praise the Lord. That's not God speaking through them. That's not the Spirit speaking. Amen? That's confusion. Amen? And so it's speaking individually of the confusion in our, in our soul or in our mind, in our emotions. It's not just the, this isn't just the corporate people, the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21 as the bride. But individually, there are things that have to take place within our woman, within our soul, amen, as we marry Christ, the Spirit of God in us, okay? So when the soul and the Spirit come into consummation, and relationship in marriage, they will produce an adoption redeeming our bodies. Let's say that again. When we come together, mind and spirit, hallelujah, they, that creates a consummation, amen, and a relationship or a marriage, praise God. The spirit that we have that's alive is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Our spirit and his spirit are inseparable, right? So they're going to produce an adoption that redeems our bodies. That's partly what he's talking about there in the I'm the vine, you're the branches. You can't produce any fruit, amen, unless you stay in connection with me, unless you stay hooked up, amen, in this relationship with the Spirit. Praise the Lord. All right, so look now, Romans chapter 8 and verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. Praise God. All right. That's what John's talking about in Revelation 2.10 when he says, Be faithful unto death, and Christ will give you a crown of life. Now, that doesn't mean be faithful till somebody shoots you on the street. You know, it doesn't mean be faithful till somebody cuts your head off. It doesn't mean be faithful till somebody kills you. Amen. There's a death accomplished in Christ at Calvary on the cross. Amen. And that's the death that we need to be faithful to. Praise God. Be faithful unto death and you will receive the crown of life. He's not talking about us getting blown away or us getting killed. He's talking about us being faithful to that death. The death of Jesus Christ. Amen? Alright. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 39. Wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. All right? Now, we always look at that as a practical teaching, right? 
But there's spiritual truth behind all of this. It isn't just about how to do our lives. Amen? So a wife's bound by the law. As long as her husband lives, she's under the law. If her husband's dead, then she's at liberty to marry whoever she wants to as long as it's in the Lord. Praise God. I find that powerful. Praise the Lord, to be quite honest with you. Because look at Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. Romans 7, 1 through 4. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. He's using this as a metaphor now for the law. How that the law has dominion over a man as long as he's alive. Right? For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she's called an adulteress. But if her husband's dead, she's free from that law so that she is no longer an adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Amen. The law is dead. That guy is gone. We are free then to marry the Lord so that we can produce fruit. Amen. Amen. Now, I said a while back, the harlot uh, Babylon says, and I, we read it here tonight, I'm a queen. I'm not a widow. Right? She continues to give out her cup full of abominations is what the scripture says. Here's the deal. We don't have to drink the cup of suffering. Understand, Jesus already drank the cup. Whatever people are going through, they don't have to go through it. If you can get control of that old gal amen, that's trying to run your life, amen, that Jezebel is what we're talking about. And it's not a female. We're, I mean, female in the sense of gender. We're talking about that side of us, that natural part of us that wants to dominate and tell us this doesn't work, it won't work, it can't work, you know, you've been having this and you've been going through this. And, and all of us have this stuff, you know, I mean, it isn't like, you know, it doesn't happen to all of us because it does. But that's what we're talking about. You've got to divorce that thing and get hooked up and stay hooked up, stay in the vine, stay connected to this new husband or you're never going to be able to produce, amen, the fruit that he wants us to produce. And likewise, we can't be redeemed. Our bodies can't be redeemed. And that's what he's talking about. There. We're not just talking about resurrection. That's, that's a fact as well. But that's something we're in the future. We're talking about redeeming this, this physical thing right now. It cries out. I mean, we know it does in all of us. Oh, God. You know, I wish I was just all Jesus now. I wish I could just get focused on that and not let the other side dominate me. Even our own souls cry out. Right? So this is, this, is where, this is what he's talking about. Amen. And we don't have to keep drinking from that cup. Amen. Praise the Lord. We keep drinking because the thing tells us you've got to keep drinking it because you're a mess. Because you're screwed up. And so, here, have another sip because you're full of abominations. You're full of junk. You're full of a mess. And you brought it on yourself and it's your fault. And on and on and on. All right? So we keep going back and taking a cup that Jesus already drank. Amen? And let me show you just an example here. Uh, Genesis 44, uh, verses 2 through 12. Or actually, just, we'll just read the 1 through 12. 20, yeah, 1 through 12. Genesis 44, just start at the beginning. We'll just read through verse 12. Now, this is about Joseph, and he's been, you know, taken into captivity. Now he's at the right hand of the Pharaoh. He's running the show. Right? His brothers came back without Benjamin. And uh, they're starving and so on and so forth. And he gives them meal. He gives them grain and sends them back and says, I'm keeping this one boy here until you bring that youngest boy back. So they go back. They tell Abraham, look, we got to take him back because, you know, or Jacob, I'm sorry. We got, to, we got to take him back because, you know, he's not going to uh, let the other kid go until we do. And this corn isn't going to last forever. And this 
this famine's going on and on and on. So they go back and they take, they take Benjamin with them. And that's where we're at. So he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in his sack's mouth. Now this is, Benjamin's with this bunch, right? And he said, Put my cup, the silver cup, and that's important, in the sack's mouth of the youngest and his corn money, and he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their asses, and, and when they were gone out of the city, and not yet far off, Joseph said unto his steward, Up, follow after the men, and when you overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have you rewarded evil for good? Is not this it which my Lord drinketh? In other words, the cup. You got the cup of the Lord, uh, uh, of, of the Master, amen? And whereby indeed he divineth. You have done evil in so doing. And he overtook them, and he spake unto them these same words. So he tells the brothers, what's wrong with you people? He just, my master's just done good to you, and now you're going to steal his, his silver cup, the cup that he drinks from, the cup that he actually prophesies from, right? And they said unto him, Wherefore saith my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servant should do according to this. Behold, the money which we found in our sack's mouths, we brought again, because that's what he did the last time. He put their money that they paid for the corn, he put it in their sack, and they brought it back the second time when they came for fear that he'd think that they ripped him off or something. So they said, did, we brought it back. When, when, when we found our sacks, uh, the money in our sack's mouth, we brought it again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of the Lord's house silver or gold? And whosoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. So if you find that cup in any of our sacks, whoever sack you find it, it kill him. And will the rest of us will just be your slaves forever. And he said, now also let it be according unto your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and you shall be blameless. Then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground, and opened every man his sack. And he searched and began at the eldest, and left at the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. So... Most of you all know this, the typology of the Old Testament. Joseph is a type of Christ, right? Benjamin is a type of the sons of God. All right? So Joseph wants to reconcile his entire family and be rejoined with his father. Right? That's the, that's the message, the story he's telling. But there's the spiritual side of this thing that he's trying to get across to it through this natural story. Right? And so he puts his empty silver cup in the mouth of Benjamin's sack. And notice, Joseph put it in a sack of corn. Praise the Lord. That's a picture of Jesus' death. Look at John 12, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Speaking of his impending uh, death and uh, resurrection. And silver is symbolic of redemption. So, here's the message. Our suffering has already been accomplished. He already drank the cup for us. His suffering was enough. So the frustrating thing for me and probably for all of us at times is we've heard this message, and it's not like we don't know it. We hear it in different ways, but it isn't like this is the first time we've heard any of this stuff, you know what I'm saying? But at times it doesn't seem like it's working. So are we going to walk away from what God has said, or are we going to be faithful to the death of Jesus Christ? It's simple. It may not always be easy, but that is the bottom line. I told Sally last night, I said, you know, I know this is, it is biblical, but it isn't biblical, and I understand that. But there's a phrase from the movie The Untouchables where uh, Sean Connery plays this Irish cop, and he said, God hates a coward. And that's my feeling. That's the way I think of the relationship. And it's not because, you know, you're, you're, we're not fearful, and, and, but being fearful doesn't make you a coward. You know, it's how you react to fear. It's how you respond to fear. And so I say that, you know, tongue in cheek, but God hates a coward because he says, perfect love casts out fear. 
there is no fear in love. If, there's, if you're having fear, it's not God. God isn't putting fear on us. That's coming from the enemy or from our own soulish realm. Amen? So we're supposed to be faithful to the death of Jesus Christ. I'm not worried about mine. I've got, got to be faithful to His. Praise the Lord. Are we going to believe that what Jesus accomplished is enough for all of our sufferings? For everything we're going through. For whatever I'm going through. It, did Jesus pay for this already? Amen. Do I have to suffer? Because He already suffered. I'm supposed to be reaping the benefits of what He suffered for. That's right. By His stripes, I'm healed. Mm -hmm. Right? He became poor, so I can become rich. Yep. Praise the Lord. So, see, for a lack of knowledge, the Scripture says... Without a vision, the people perish. For a lack of understanding, we suffer unnecessarily. There's only one revelation in the entire Bible. That revelation is Jesus Christ. Now we get all we can glean all sorts of things from that, but the revelation is always it always takes us to Jesus. It always points us. Just the manna is a, is the example. That's the reason I use that. It's a perfect example because they thought it was all about bread. They thought it was all about... He said, see, your focus is on the fishes and the loaves. Your focus is on the natural thing instead of what that's trying to point you to. Now, these people had no faith, so they were, they were strictly stuck in what their soul could experience. And he's trying to lead them out of that. He's trying to take them into a spiritual dimension where they could understand some things. And he does it with us. That's what he does with us continuously. Yes. I mean, you all know, you hear a song on the radio, maybe some secular song, but yet G you, you hear Jesus in it. You know, you, hear, you make a connection with a, a spiritual. I, it happens to me all the time. And some of the songs, if I were to tell you, you'd say, you're out of your mind. Because, I mean, I'm not listening to, you know, Christian radio all the time. But I'm still hearing the voice of God. And in situations and circumstances and you know, throughout the day, you know, you have interactions with people and you can see God dealing in these things. It's, it's natural stuff. And yet you can see a spiritual, you know, kind of, uh, in, in notation or annotation even, you know, to it, that it's trying to take you into something beyond that. Praise the Lord. So revelation 22 verses 18 and 19. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now this used to freak me out when I'd read it. Of course, the whole book of Revelation freaked me out. But I've come to the understanding, to some degree at least, that it isn't supposed to be spooking us. It's supposed to be showing Jesus. It, we're supposed, if we're not getting the revelation of Jesus, we're not getting the revelation. We're, we're, we're being led into some other kind of craziness. Amen? So anything that you add to the revelation of Jesus Christ, because if you just even read the, the, you know, the preliminary, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right. Now the entire Bible is, but specifically it even tells us this, at the beginning of the book of Revelation. So anything then, based on this scripture, anything you add to the revelation of Jesus Christ adds plagues, the plagues of the scripture, to your life. Mm -hmm. Likewise, anything you take away from the revelation of Jesus Christ is going to do the same thing. Now he's not talking about God sending, you know, vipers and, you know, giant locusts the size of, you know, Volkswagens and stuff. He's talking about if you take away the healing of Jesus, you're going to suffer the consequences of that. Right? If you take away, amen, the, the, uh, the fact that Jesus suffered poverty so that we could become rich. He, he gave up the riches of heaven. Now, we may think, well, he, he didn't have it bad down here. We're not. That isn't even the comparison. It's the riches of glory that God wants to bestow upon us, not natural, not just the, what you can get and eke out of this life, but what God could give you endless provision. You see what I'm saying? That's what Jesus gave up. 
And people say, well, you know, he, he, he had it pretty good. You know, he, he had a, they must have had it pretty good. He had to have a treasurer. I mean, I've heard all these crazy things. Well, yeah, I don't think he was hurting. I mean, that would be stupid. Why, why would he go without when he had faith? When he, he knew that he could have all things. But he gave up the fullness of glory, the Godhead itself, to come here so that we could experience his wealth, his inheritance. Amen? Praise the Lord. So, Jesus' stripes aren't enough for my healing. I'm adding plagues. Praise the Lord. His becoming poor for my wealth, if that's not enough, I'm adding plagues. Lack. Not enough. You know what I'm saying? And if I add to the goodness of God and say that, well, you know, He's not just good, He's just, and He's, a lot of times you're going to take Him off, and if you do, you'll get the right hand of fellowship right upside your head. We're adding something that isn't the truth about Jesus. And we suffer the consequences. Then we live in condemnation and fear and trepidation and and anxiety and all of these other things. It isn't God doing it. We're bringing it on ourselves. Praise the Lord. So when people say we need to suffer with Christ in order for us to reign with Christ, they're missing the whole point. The Greek word isn't, that word for suffering there isn't pain or agony, but it has the connotation of if we will not back down under pressure, we will reign with Him. Wow. Praise the Lord. If, if we'll be steadfast, we'll reign in this life. We'll reign with Christ. Praise God. Amen. So when things come against us, we've got to be faithful to the death of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Amen. This is killing me. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It already killed him. Yes. And you just need to be faithful to his death, and you will reap the benefits. You'll have a crown of glory in this life. You'll have all you need. You'll reign with him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Revelation 12 and 11. See, we need to, this is why we got to keep feeding ourselves. Because no matter how many times you hear it, you're going to go back out there and you're going to get slapped upside the head by the world, by reality, by your own soul, by your own thinking, by your own rationale, by circumstances and the flesh and the five senses. And if you're not prepared, you're going to be drinking from a cup that you should not be drinking of, that he's already drank the whole thing. Amen. You're going to be suffering the plagues that you have no business suffering. You've got to be faithful to his death. Faithful to what he accomplished. Amen? So they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death, unto the death. Yeah. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Resist him. Amen? Be faithful to Jesus' death. And he'll leave you alone. That's right. He cannot affect you spiritually. Your spirit. I'll take that back. He, he, cannot, he cannot overcome your spirit. So he has to attack you in the soul realm, in the physical realm, in the sense realm. So that he can get that to dominate your spirit. So you're not faithful unto his death. You're not faithful to what he has accomplished. You give up. You start saying all kinds of stuff that's not biblical. And you start bringing on plagues that you shouldn't be dealing with. You shouldn't have to have to mess with. But there's a requirement. And the only requirement is be faithful unto his death. Make that be the constant amen that you always have to fall back to. When the enemy comes in like a flood. The Lord will lift up a standard. He already had the standard is be faithful unto his death. Resist the devil. That's how you resist him. And he will flee from you. Romans 6 and verse 5. Oh, 
For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now that's simple enough, even from my mind. If I'm faithful to that kind of death, then I'll be faithful to that kind of resurrection. Are you I mean if I'm faithful, if if I'm faithful to his death, then I'm gonna the, the result is this thing will be resurrected. I'll be faithful to that resurrection. In other words, my focus will be on the spirit. Am I making sense? So if I'm faithful to his death, if I'm planted together in the likeness of his death, and I understand that, and I'm faithful to that, then there's no way that I can't experience resurrection life. Christ in me. Me in him. Amen. No lack. Healing, deliverance, all those things. That's the result of it. It's, it's, the, it's the natural consequence of doing it. If I'm faithful to his death, the natural result is I'm going to experience resurrection. I don't have to be focused on that. I need to be focused on being faithful to his death. Yes. Believing that he accomplished everything in that death is going to give me the results of resurrection life. Can't do anything else. Praise the Lord. All right. Romans uh, chapter 6, uh, verse 7 and 9. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Alright, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 14 through 21. 1 Corinthians 10, 14 through 21. We're about done. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. That harlot wants to be worshipped. It's idolatry when we allow ourselves to let ourselves dominate our suke. Praise the Lord. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread, one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. You can't serve two masters. We are either crucified with Christ or we aren't. We're either raised with him or we're not. You can't see it's a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. These are all the same thing he's telling us over and over and over, just in different ways, just like he did with the Jews. The bread you're worried about is not the bread I'm talking about. I'm talking about me. Consume me. You know, drink my blood. Eat my flesh. We become one. We, you'll have provision for life everlasting in this world and in the world to come. And you're worried about your daily bread? I am your daily bread. That was the first battle Jesus had. Turn these stones into bread. And Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The provider is the provision. 
you keep your focus on the provider, the provision will just show up. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. He said that kingdom is near you, but it shall be in you. And all these things are added unto you. And we get our eyes off of the kingdom, the spirit, and onto the flesh, the things, and then we just got chaos. All right, last scripture, Acts chapter 17 and verse 28. See, it is a discipline, but it's a discipline right here. It's not a physical work, 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 and be perfect and all that. It's a, it's a disciplining of your mind, renewing your mind to the Word of God. Because if you don't do that, you're, you're unstable in all your ways. You're going to be manipulated. You're going to be flipped out here, and you're going to be taken advantage of there, and you're going to be suffering plagues that are not yours to suffer. You're going to be drinking from a cup that you have no business drinking from. You're going to be experiencing lack that you have been provided for. So, for in Him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. So, for in Him we live and move and have our being. Okay, I get that. Spiritual life can't be compartmentalized away from our natural life. Our natural life has to be conformed to our spiritual life. The spirit life correlates to the soul or to the physical life. They're supposed to be connecting. They're supposed to be correlating. They're supposed to be us and God, our spirit and soul, mind and spirit becoming one. Amen? Elementary science, junior high, or maybe even before, it tells us oxygen, water, and food. That will enable you to live and to move and to be alive, right? No. It's in Him that we have our being. Yeah. See, there's a... It's not contrary. It's the same. They are to connect. So we have this physical reality. But it's only natural. Because without Him, we're dead whether we're getting bread, water, and oxygen or not. Uh -huh. Amen? But if we have Him, whether we're getting bread, water, and oxygen is irrelevant. We will live anyway. Yep. You see what I'm saying? Yep. That's just a simple analogy of the way we live our lives. We're all about getting the oxygen, the water, amen, and the bread, and forgetting that it's in Him that we literally live, that we move and have our being. And that's why I'm saying we have, we have dumbed down this being in Christ to the point where it's practically incoherent. I mean, when I mean that, I mean, I don't mean almost co incoherent. I mean, in the practical sense, it's become untrue, un unreal. And if that is not true, then we wouldn't be saying things like, God's not doing this. God's not doing what I what his word says. God's not doing this for me. God's not going to make this happen. And I don't care how long you've been going. The problem is your own testimony tells me you're not living according to the word of God because you're not living by the blood of the lamb. You're not living. You're not willing to, to come to the end of yourself, to his death. You're not being faithful to his death. Amen. Right? Praise the Lord. You're not. And if you're not, then you have no reason to rationally expect that there would be a resurrection. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. The moment your testimony deviates from the finished work of the cross, you're telling me something that is not in agreement with the word of God. Now, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm not, I'm not singling anybody out. I hope nobody's getting the wrong impression here. I'm just saying, all of us have this struggle. All of us have to go through this. And, it's, and we wonder why the inconsistency in our lives. And we all have it. The only, the only rational way of overcoming this thing is by the Spirit. 
Praise the Lord. And until we do that, don't tell me this doesn't work. That's just, that's just foolishness. That's just your ignorance. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. I'm just saying, don't tell me this doesn't work unless you're willing to believe unto death, His death. Unless you're willing to go as far as it's got to take you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. See, we want immediate, we want drive through results. The problem is, uh, our windows won't roll down. You know, we're driving up and we're, we're trying to get something that we can't get because we have no access to it, even though we're speeding right up there. You see what I'm saying? We're, we're trying to get something in a way that it can't be given to us. Faithful unto death, you receive a crown of life. What is it? It's, it's, it's exactly what he's saying in Romans where he says that uh, because of the grace of God, we will rule and reign in life yes. by Jesus Christ Amen. because of His grace. Yes. To reign means you're on the throne. Mm -hmm. You're not begging. Whatever you say, you get. Mm -hmm. The whole kingdom is designed to satisfy you, your needs, your wants, whatever the desire of your heart you see what I'm saying? But it doesn't just happen. It just doesn't drop out of heaven like manna. They still had to go gather it every day. Praise the Lord. And they could only gather enough for that day. Because tomorrow, the problems of tomorrow are sufficient to themselves. You get through today and you think you got the victory. Well, praise the Lord. You better be in Christ. Because tomorrow's coming and it's going to have its own set of circumstances and issues for you to deal with. And you're going to have to believe in for those as well. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Hope I'm not seeming harsh or critical here tonight. But I want us. I don't, you know, I, I can't control what anybody else does outside of this church. I can't even control what goes on with this church. I'm just saying, I want, if I'm going to have any influence, I want it to be here. I want us to experience this. And that's what we're supposed to be experiencing. Amen. And it hurts me to see people not receiving the blessings that God has promised them. And it's not God's fault. I'm guilty the same as everybody else is. You can get in the flesh in a heartbeat, believe me. And listen, I'll tell you something else. What you preach is what you give. And I can testify to it. You start saying stuff, and the next thing you know, that enemy is right there to show you how shallow and how insufficient you are. Just because you say it doesn't mean you have it. Amen? you got to live it. you got to live it out. But if we're going to... Look, I'm not afraid of the devil. It's ignorance that scares me. The devil's under my feet as long as I can keep that foremost. You know what I'm saying? He's not going to be my problem. But it's for lack of knowledge that we perish and that we suffer lack. Okay? Amen. So, praise the Lord. Let's, let's get it under control. Let's be faithful unto death. Not ours. He's already paid the price. Let's be faithful to that finished work and see what God will do in our lives. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Thank you, Thank you Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen. It is finished. Yes. It all belongs to us. Get you some of that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Praise God.